A Christian is a person who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ, believing that he died on the cross for their sins and rose again, and they have called on his name and placed their faith in him for salvation. And when he saves them, he becomes, when he saves us, he became our Lord and our Savior. He became our teacher, our example. Uh, We seek to follow him and know him and learn from him. But the greatest the greatest goal, really, of our lives as Christians is that we want to be like him. We want to live like he lived. We, we want to love like he loved. Now, we know that in this life, we'll never perfectly do that. But we desire that. We want to be like him. We want to walk as he walked and live as he lived. And to do that, we must learn to think as he thinks. We must learn to think as God thinks, as Jesus thinks. And the Bible even tells us that this is the goal of our lives, uh, one of the goals of our life. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That passage, that word there in that passage, mind, means mindset. It means way of thinking. It's even translated attitude. By the way, your attitude is formed by your thinking. When you have a bad attitude, it's because you have bad thinking. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to learn the mind of Christ. And we've got to think what God wants us to think. And the Bible tells us that we're to do that. We cannot be conformed to this world, but we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Our continual renewing of our minds. Learning to think and the way God would have us to think. And to do that, we must have the word of God. Now, we're in a series of messages that I've entitled, Strengthen What Remains, from Revelation 3, 2. And that verse says this, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. And Jesus spoke that word to a church in Sardis, the dead church. And we talked about there are some things that we need to strengthen as a church. And one of those things is what does it mean to be a member of the church and why is it important? We need to strengthen that in our day and age and even in our church. By being a member, I mean a person who's identified themselves as a Christian and identified with these other folks that around them that they want to be part, they want to be active, they want to be faithful, they want to be committed, they want to be recognized as part of the local church. But the only way that we're going to have the right mind about the church is to get the mind of Jesus about the church. That's the only way. We can have the mind of man. We can have the mind of the culture. We can have our own thoughts. But what does God say? My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. Jesus has some things that he thinks about the church. And if we're going to follow him, we have to think like he thinks. And so we open this morning to a text that is the greatest New Testament text on marriage. But its example for marriage is Christ and the church. And from this text, we're going to see the attitude of Jesus, the mindset of Jesus towards the church. And then we're going to ask ourselves, is my mind... The same as his mind. And where it's not, am I willing to have a change of mind? And that's what the Bible says is repentance. To change your mind. It's the beginning of repentance. Am I willing to change my mind if what I think doesn't line up with what God thinks? Ephesians chapter 5, you would join with me in standing for the honor of God's word, the honor of the reading of God's word. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22, we're going to read down to verse 32. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. 
So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Let's pray. Father, speak to us this morning, and may we have the mind of Christ, not just about the church, but about everything. Help us to grow with a renewed mind. And this morning, change our minds where we're wrong, Lord. Change our minds when we're thinking wrong. Help us to be more like Jesus. And today, if there's one here who's never said yes to Jesus, change their mind, change their heart, and may today be the day of salvation. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. This passage, I've never preached this passage this way. I've preached it about marriage, which is obviously a major point of this text. But you see, as Paul works through this text, there's this underlying truth of Christ and the church. And this gives us, I'm going to give you three things that we see from this text that we can learn about how Jesus thinks or his attitude towards the church, how his mind is towards the church. So three quick things. Number one, the first is this, Jesus is connected With the church. He is connected with the church. Last week we saw the text that Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I've told you what Jesus is doing on the earth is building his church. This passage uh, paints a vivid picture of how connected to the church Jesus is. Both universally and locally. He's connected to all the church everywhere, but he's connected to each local body. When you read Revelation 1 through 3 and he gives those messages to the church, the Bible tells us that he walks among the lampstands. He's in the midst of those churches. And so Jesus is connected. He is united with the church. We, we have three words that we've taught you about how to, uh, to be a follower of Jesus. And we use the word abide. It means we're to seek to abide in Christ daily. We're to pray and walk in the word and live a relationship with God. But then second word is to unite. We're to unite with Christ's body. We're to be united and connected. And then the third word is to share in his mission. Jesus is united and connected with his church. And this passage gives us several ways. One is this. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the head of the church. This means he is the Lord, the master. He is in charge. He's not like some CEOs ahead of a corporation with millions and millions of people and and hundreds and thousands of stores and he'll never go to all of them. Jesus is connected with each member of his body and he's in every church. He can visit. He's there all the time. Jesus is connected like no other head. Colossians 1, 18 says this, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And as such as the head, this means he is over us individually. We make the confession, Jesus is Lord. But he's also over us corporately. And we are subject to him. Look at what he says there in verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ. The church is subject to Christ. Submissive to Christ. Under the authority of Christ. And as such, Jesus has given pastors and overseers the responsibility to lead the church. And he's given them the responsibility to watch over his church. It's a responsibility I take very seriously. Hebrews 13 speaks of this uh, a couple of times. In verse 7, it says this, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Those who oversee you, they've spoken the word to you. They've, they're trying to set an example of faith for you. Later on in that chapter, in verse 13, he says this, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. Be unprofitable to cause grief to those who watch out for your soul. Jesus is the head of the church, and he's placed people in positions to watch out and to be his mouthpiece and his under-shepherd and those because Jesus is the head. There's a second thing that we see from this text. In being connected, he is the savior of the body. He is the Savior of the body. He says it there at the end of verse 23. Christ is also the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body. 
Christians make up the body of Christ, both universally and locally. Most churches have a building, but there are going to be churches that meet today that don't have a building. There'll be churches in parts of the world, they'll meet under a tree somewhere. But that body is still his body. They've met together. They've come together. That he's the savior of the body. Now think about this picture of body. You want to talk about being connected? Let's think about the body. Where do you go that your body doesn't go? Now you go a lot of places that your mind doesn't go. Church is one of them. I mean, just think. Just think about this. How many times a week do you drive to work and when you get there, you don't even remember anything you saw on the way because your mind was somewhere else. You were driving and all of this, but you don't remember anything you saw on the way. You get so used to that trip, that place you're going, that path you're going, and you don't even think about unless there's something major like a, you know, a wreck or something and it slows you down and you're already running late. You remember that. But our minds go other places. Some of you today are at Home Depot right now. <laughs> or you're, you're thinking about the race. Or some of you gone to your happy place, the Bahamas or some tropical place. But the reality is eventually you will come back and you will realize you're here in Kansas City in church. Because that's where your body is. No matter how far your mind goes off. No matter how many times it goes off. And goes off in the wilderness mentally. You're going to come back and there's your body going to be here. And you are where your body is. Jesus is where his body is. Regardless how weak and pitiful that body can be at times. Jesus is where his body is. The Bible says he is the savior of the body. He is the savior of the church. Sometimes someone will ask, well, isn't Jesus the Savior of the world? Well, yes, he is in the sense that he's the only Savior for the world. But he's only the Savior of the church. See, he's the only Savior for the whole world. But when you believed, you became part of the church. When you repent, you become part of the church. You become part of the body. And Jesus is the Savior only for those who have truly believed. Remember last week we studied that text in Matthew 16 where it says, Jesus said, upon this rock. And Peter had made that that confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, only flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then Peter confessed with his mouth the Lord Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Upon this rock of that confession of faith, I will build my church. And every time someone confessed Jesus, he's building his church. He's the savior of the body. Thirdly, he's the husband of the bride. The overarching theme of this passage is marriage. And Christ is pictured as the husband. The church is pictured as the bride. And we'll see it more in a moment. It's it's present tense. It's ongoing. It's even future tense. We'll see in just a moment. I'm going to show you that this is a great future picture in heaven of this marriage. And marriage, Jesus is telling us that he's married to the church. And the Bible speaks of that as the highest earthly relationship we can have. Matter of fact, in this text, Paul goes all the way back into Genesis chapter 1. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2. He goes all the way back because this is the primary relationship. The earthly relationship is husband and wife. And Jesus said, this this is the church. Jesus is married to the church. And yet... Many Christians sometimes want to date the church. I heard of a book, I, didn't, I don't have it, but a guy named Joshua Harris wrote a book years ago that said, Stop Dating the Church, Fall in Love with the Family of God. And I was thinking about that book this week and just so have it. I ran across an article by David Platt and we've read his book Radical a few years ago. And he had an article that he posted just last week, the week prior week. Uh, A week ago, he posted this, and the title of the article is this, Why We Date the Church. And he says this, 
It's often said that Christians approach church attendance like dating relationships. In our contemporary church culture, we hop from one church to the next based on how we feel. We attend one church for a while, and then we go to a different church. Being a Christian is what matters most. We are part of the global church. After all, why would we need to commit our lives to one local church? What's the point of becoming a member just to vote in business meetings? That certainly doesn't seem worth it. So we end up dating the church. And he gave several reasons. He gave six. I'm going to give you three of them that I thought were really uh, pertinent for us to think about. One, he says, we date the church because we're independent people who live in a very individualistic culture. We are self-made, self-reliant, self-sufficient people. The thought, listen to this, of mutual commitment, mutual submission, mutual accountability and interdependence in a church seems foreign and frightening to us. Church daters are careful to avoid getting involved too much, especially with people. They don't pay much attention to God's larger purpose for them as a vital part of a specific church family. They go through the motions without really investing themselves. The second thing he says, we date the church because we are indecisive. We cannot decide which church we really like. We, we kind of apply the consumer mentality to the church, shopping for the best package for the best price on Sunday morning. Church daters are, are short on allegiance and quick to find fault in the church. They treat the church with a consumer mentality, looking for the best product, listen to this, for the price of their Sunday morning. I'm giving you my Sunday morning. Make it worth my while. And we kind of apply that to everything because that's who we are in America. And listen, the church is trying to keep up with that. So this is kind of where we are. And I'm not saying you shouldn't ever leave a church. I'll talk about that in a moment. But we have to be very careful that we don't apply worldly thinking to the church. We can't treat church like a restaurant or a place you get your hair cut. Number three, he says, we date the church because we are inundated. Church gets choked out because we're tied up with so many things in our lives. We talk about being busy all the time. But we're overwhelmed with events and obligations and opportunities, whether it's our job or our kids' sports or this opportunity or that activity. And we feel pressure to get so many things done that committing ourselves to the church seems like too much for our already busy lives. Basically, we have too many dates to get married. There's too many opportunities to settle down. So when I study the Bible, I always ask myself questions of what I'm reading. Now, I don't question the Bible like I don't believe that type of stuff, but I read a text and I say, what does this mean? I read a text and I say, how did this happen? What did this look like? You ever read some things in the Bible and you're reading and you're like, you ever let your sanctified imagination go and thought, man, what would this actually look like? What would the, how would the people have looked when this happened? It's really funny sometimes if you let yourself think about it. I just imagine if this happened in an average church, it would be hilarious. But I ask myself other questions like, how do I relate to this and where do I stand in relation to this? So here's a question I, I ask about this this text, this truth, Jesus is connected with the church, am I? Have I joined? Well, I have. I'm the pastor, so I joined. They required it. Uh, but am I formally, actively, uh, practically committed, involved? Am I attached and we're not the first generation or the only generation to have this problem. Every generation's had this problem because man thinks he can do God's stuff his way. All through history, mankind has believed that he can do what he wants to do and, get, and, and be right with God. You know, we, we baptize a little bit of this. We, we throw a little religious terminology around, but we do things our way. Every generation has faced it. And Charles Spurgeon, uh, the great Baptist pastor uh, from the 19th century, must have been dealing with this because this is what he said about this idea of, of not being involved and not being committed to the church. He said this, I believe that every Christian ought to be joined to some visible church. That is his plain duty according to the scriptures. Now listen to this. God's people are not dogs. Else they might go about one by one, but they are sheep. Therefore, they should be in flocks. 
Now, I know there are some who say, well, I hope I have given myself to the Lord, but I do not intend to give myself to any church because, and Spurgeon in his imaginary conversations, imaginations are great, aren't they? He says this, now, why not? Well, because, because I'm a Christian without it. So Spurgeon said, now, are you quite clear upon that? You can be as good a Christian by disobedience to the Lord's commands as by being obedient Well, suppose everybody else did the same. Suppose all Christians in the world said, I shall not join the church. Well, there would be no visible church. There'd be no ordinances. There'd be no baptisms. There'd be no Lord's Supper. We celebrated the Lord's Supper last week. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. What if nobody showed up? You know what that would tell you? Nobody remembered Jesus. That would be a, he said that would be a very bad thing, and yet one doing it, what is right for one is right for all. Why should not all of us do it? Then you believe that if you were to do an act which has a tendency to destroy the invisible church, excuse me, the visible church of Christ, you would be as good a Christian as if you did your best to build up that church. I do not believe it, sir, nor neither do you. And he's right. We can say that, but we deep down inside don't believe it. So the question is, Jesus is connected with the church. Am I? The second section I want you to see, the second thing I want you to see, Jesus is not only connected with the church, Jesus loves the church. Jesus loves the church. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Listen, men, that verse alone in for about marriage will do enough to just keep you busy the rest of your life if you're a married man. That scripture enough. If you put it somewhere and you memorize it and you think about it, that'll keep you busy. That'll keep you changing all the time. That'll keep you humble because it's an amazing passage of scripture. But the question comes, the Bible says that he loves the church. Well, doesn't God love the world? Well, yes. We know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. Doesn't God love the world? Yes, he does. But think about it. I love my neighbors. I love you. But I don't love you like I love Karen. I don't love my neighbors like I love Karen. See, Jesus loves the world. But he doesn't love the world like he loves the church. Because that church is his special bride. That church has entered into this relationship with him. That church has honored him by faith. That church has honored him by repentance. That church is special to him. He gave himself for the church. And there are a couple of things about how he loves this church. He loves the church. One is personally. Notice this. Husband, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church, his wife. Husband, love your wives. This is personal. Jesus loves each Christian personally, and he loves each church personally. And the church is a precious jewel to Jesus. You read some of the Old Testament prophecies about the church, and the prophets did speak about it. They didn't use the word church, but they spoke about this era that we live in now when the Jews would be falling away, but God would be gathering a people from the Gentiles. And Zechariah 9.16 is one of those passages. Look what it says. The Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they shall be like the jewels of a crown, lifted like a banner over his land. Like the jewels of a crown. Precious, priceless, expensive. Something you like to show off. And women get those rings, they like to show those rings off. I ain't never seen a man walk up to a woman and say, hey, let me see the engagement ring he bought you. (laughs) Right, men, you ever done that? Men are thinking... Oh, man, he must have paid a lot for that. (laughs) But he says, like a jewel. The church is a jewel to Jesus. He personally loves this church. Not just the church. He loves every church. He loves his church. Some people like going to church. But they don't necessarily love the church. Saying I love church is kind of like saying I love wives. Karen's not here, so don't tell her I said that. That's just a joke. But Karen wouldn't take it really good if I said, hey, I just love wives. His wife and his wife and his wife and his wife. That's not going real well. (laughs) 
Jesus loves his church, and you and I are to love the church he sends us to. Do you love this church? Is Haven precious to you? Because he loves the church personally, he speaks personally to each church. One of the things we can learn about in the book of Revelation is that he had a message for each church. Go read those two chapters, Revelation 2 and 3. There was a special message to each one. Imagery that, is, that, was, that spoke definitely to that particular church in that particular city. He even addressed particular individuals in those churches by name. He has a message. And I want to tell you, what I'm telling you today, what I've been preaching on, I believe with all my heart is God's message to us for such a time as this. I believe the Father gave it to me as his under-shepherd. It's his message to us. Remember when he spoke in Revelation, he said to the angel of the church, that was the messenger. God gave a message. In Revelation 3.19, he says this, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. He spoke that right into the life of the church. I love you. I'm telling you to do this because I love you. Jesus loves the church personally, but he also loves the church sacrificially. Sacrificially, the Bible says that he gave himself for the church. Jesus didn't send an angel. He didn't shed the blood. A prophet's blood didn't purchase the church. The apostles' blood didn't purchase the church, although they shed their blood for it. Jesus shed his own blood. Earlier in the book of Acts, Paul spoke to the leaders of this church here in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. And he said these words, Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. This church is a blood-bought church. This church wasn't bought by the money that we got from the sale of the property. This building was bought by that. This church was bought by blood. Every soul was bought by blood. And listen, we should never stop preaching the blood because the blood's the only way anybody's getting to heaven. And the only thing that's going to pay for your sins is the blood of Jesus. He purchased us with his own blood. Now, when does he stop giving to the church? When does he stop paying and stop caring for you? Oh, he's paid your sin debt. It's paid. But can you think about how many other things he's done for you? How many other things he's given to you? How many other ways he's met your needs? He's given to you personally and sacrificially. So here's the question. Jesus loves the church. Do I? Jesus loves the church, this church. Do I? Do I personally love this church? Do I love the people? Do I care that the ministry of this church is strong and effective? Do do I long to see a strong gospel witness in this community? Am I willing to give up myself, my resources, my time, my energy, my talents for this church? Am I willing to sacrifice for Christ and his church? Can I be counted on? Would you be brokenhearted if God called you to leave? See, here's the deal. I believe you should leave a church when God calls you to. Just like I believe you, could, you should join one when God calls you to. And I believe you're out of the will of God when you do that, when you join and God hadn't called you, and when you leave and God hadn't called you. I'm going to be brokenhearted when God calls me to leave this church. There'll come a day. Now, he may call me home and I die. Now, I won't be brokenhearted. I just go in the presence of Jesus. That happens all the time. People didn't know they were leaving. They just left. <laughs> you know, God's in charge of you leaving. But the time comes when God calls me to leave, I'm going to be brokenhearted. But I'll trust the Lord and go in his will. But I want to ask you folks, we've got to love the church enough to go as he calls, to stay, to join, and to leave when he commands Jesus loves the church, do I? Well, there's the last thing I want to share with you this morning. Jesus is patient with the church. Jesus is patient with the church. Look at this passage, verse 26. We we left in verse 25. He loved the church, gave himself for, and verse 26 picks up that. He gave himself for that. He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without 
blemish. And early, later on in that passage, he says in verse 29, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Jesus is patient with the church. Now, Jesus is perfect. Everybody agree with that? But the perfect one doesn't have a perfect church. Not yet. The perfect one does not have a perfect church just yet. But one day, he will. But in the meantime, he is working continually that he might sanctify and cleanse her. This is ongoing with the washing of water by the word. See, one of the reasons you need the word in your life is so God might continue to cleanse you and sanctify you and set you apart from this world and set you apart to himself. One of the reasons you need the word is that you might be conformed to the image of his son Jesus by the renewing of your mind. God uses the word of God. That's why we need it in our daily lives. That's why we need to hear it preached. That's why we need to go to a Bible study group and discuss it and learn about it and hear what God is saying because God has begun something in us and he wants to finish it. Philippians 1 6 Paul says this being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ God's working on us and it's not going to be complete there's coming that day the day of Jesus when everything God's going to do in you and everything God's going to do in me and everything God's going to do in us will be done but he's going to complete that work he's continually working and he's seeking to one day present this church As a bride without spot or blemish. You see that? In verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. This is the picture of a glorious bride. Excuse me, a glorious bride on her wedding day. A glorious bride who's dressed in the the, the finest wedding dress and and she'll look the best she's ever looked. Now, men, I know you've been married to your wife a long time. And as you love her, you can say to her many times that she's prettier than she's ever been. She looks better to you than she's ever looked because you love her. And you've been through life with her. But one day when Jesus takes us out of this world, he's going to make us perfect and complete without spot or blemish. There's a great picture of this in Revelation chapter 19. Look at these verses. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You don't think it matters how you live? You know what you'll be dressed in? That fine linen will be the righteous acts. How you followed, how you trusted, how you obeyed. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. A great celebration in heaven when all of God's church is gathered around and his bride is whole and complete. These are the true sayings of God. Now listen, the church is in what we would be what we would call the betrothal stage to Jesus we're betrothed to Jesus right now. Remember the story of Joseph and Mary and Mary was betrothed to Joseph. And remember when she became with child, Joseph was going to do what? He was going to put her away privately. He was going to have to divorce her. Why? Because being betrothed meant that she belonged to him and he belonged to her. And while they hadn't come together yet as husband and wife, they were as good as married. And they had to honor it just like marriage. And then there was going to come that time when they would come together and she would move under his roof and they would be together and they would, the two would become one. See, right now, the church is betrothed to Jesus. How do I know that? The Bible tells me. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. See, what happens is this. We're betrothed to Jesus. And one day when he gathers all his church, why do you think there's going to be a rapture? Because he's going to get everybody that belongs to him. Everybody's in heaven waiting. Everybody that's down on earth, he raptures us all. And that whole church gathers around that marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And that betrothal ends and it becomes a marriage now. Now Jesus is patient with us. You know what he knows? He knows that none of us are perfect personally, right? Doesn't God know you're not perfect? He does. Your wife knows and God knows. And, and the rest of us are pretty confident about it too. But he's patient with us, isn't he? Do you ever get up in the morning and say, thank you for the mercies of God? Thank you for the long-suffering of God? See, the long-suffering of God doesn't when, doesn't, just wasn't when you were unsaved and all that. God's been long-suffering with you ever since you got saved. Every morning of your life, you got saved, you get up and say, the, mer- the, the, the Lord's mercies are new every morning. Why? Because you needed new mercy every morning. Because he's patient with us. He's patient with his church. He's patient with me. He's patient with you. Even while he knows not one church is perfect, even those he rebuked, he was patient with. In Revelation chapter 2, he spoke to that woman Jezebel about her sin. In Revelation 2.21, it says this, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. She was doing something horrible and wicked in the church. And you know what he said? I gave her time to repent. Has God been patient with you? See, Jesus is patient with the church, but the question is, am I? Do I expect perfection? Am I easily offended and put off? Do do I threaten to leave if something doesn't go my way or I don't like this or I don't like that? Can I accept less than perfection or even less than I desire? Sometimes as a pastor, I have to ask myself that. Can I accept less than I desire? Can I accept less than I know we should? Can I accept less than perfection? Well, God certainly does with me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, verse 2 through 4 says this. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love. Look at this, being of one accord, all this unity of the, same, of the one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better Than himself, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is patience. This is taking a patient look and a loving look and realizing the church is imperfect. And if Jesus can deal with it, why can't I? Jesus is patient with the church. But this this brings another question or another thought to mind. Jesus is working to improve the church. Am I? Am I working to be the best Christian I can be? Am I working to be the best church member I can be? Am I working to help you in your faith? Am am I working to improve this church? Or or am I like, well, I don't know why they don't do that. I wish the church would do this. Man, this church, uh, this church, that church, those people. One man says this, people have developed a critical eye towards the church. They think they are accomplishing something by logging the church's faults and complaining about it. God says to repent of a critical spirit and have an attitude of genuine concern. That is what people who love the Lord do. They see a problem and truly desire that it be fixed according to God's word and God's way. That kind of concern leads to positive change for both us and the church. Jesus is patient, but he's also working to improve. Many times, God's grace has touched my heart by his long-suffering with me when I've repeated some of the same mistakes, even some of the same sins. When I haven't been sensitive to the Holy Spirit more than once about the same issue, he's patient. So let me ask, do we need to change our thinking about the church? Do we need to have a change of mind about how we think about the church, about the people, about the ministry, about whatever that we are dealing with? Do we need to have a change of mind about how we think about our lives and our commitment to God and to his church? If it doesn't line up with what Jesus thinks, then we do. Some of you here today need to go sign up for the next step class. Uh, I think it's November the 4th. We're going to have that, and you need to join, and it's your time, and you need to make that commitment. God's calling you 
Some of you need to be in a Bible study group. You need to make a commitment to get in Bible study where you can fellowship with other Christians and learn the word of God and hear others' prayers and pray for them and their needs. Some of you need to volunteer in a ministry and say, I'm a member and I attend, but my gifts are on the shelf. I've hidden my lamp under a bushel and now it's time for me to get serious about serving. Some of you need to commit and get betrothed and stop dating and say, I'm in. Maybe some of you here today have never been baptized. You've never taken the step of believer's baptism and said, I'm a Christian, but, but I need to identify with Jesus Christ and the church. And you, by the way, we always, we always baptize when other Christians are around because it's a testimony of I believe in him and I'm joining you. Baptism is a testimony. I believe in him and I'm joining you who believe in him. I'm going with you who believe in him because you're going somewhere. You're, you're going closer to God. You're going out in this world for God. You're going out across this land and you're, you're a part of the gospel ministry and I'm going with you. And maybe there's someone here today, you're in the church, but you're not part of it. You've never been saved. And you've sat in a church service every Sunday of your life and that will not make you a Christian if you've never repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never called on his name and said, I believe that Jesus died for me. I realize I'm a sinner and I've fallen short. I know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life in Jesus Christ, and I believe in him. Today, whatever your decision is, whatever your need is, you come. There's decisions you need to make, you come. You need to seek the Lord, you come.